What's good, everybody? I'm Keandre. This is Hoopin' Elect, and welcome back to the channel. Now, there's been a whole lot going on in the draft space since the last one of these that we did. We've got big time risers like Keyshawn George and Johnny Furphy really asserting themselves as 2024 prospects, and then a bunch of others that are important movers across the board as well. And even though there is still like four and a half months, until the draft this is the time of year where things start to look just a little bit more like it will in june but yeah spend a lot of time on this as usual be sure to leave a like and subscribe and we'll go ahead and get into some of those on the extended board outside of the top 60. a big story the rest of the way as it is in most years will be in who ends up declaring especially with the type of nil opportunities still growing out there but as it is right now there are still quite a few players i wanted to have on this board and i think are draftable or two-way candidates on down but i briefly wanted to talk about a few Few young guys of interest too. Ul Chamche will be on this board if he doesn't commit to a college in the near future, so we'll see what he does. I'm behind on watching Hanson Young, but he's looked like a draftable talent from what I've seen so far. I think KJ Evans of Oregon makes more sense long term. Another guy in a similar position, I would take Bub Carrington in this draft if he declared, but he's got a negative BPM in 11 top 100 quality games, and I just think he could use another year to maximize his game and his stock. And then Bronny James hasn't quite produced enough for me to throw him in there and I think it's best for him to just be patient now I still think he's an eventual NBA contributor and is unfairly scrutinized a lot of the time but he's got some things to figure out and hopefully he does it on his own timeline rather than chasing something that he might not be ready for but getting into the top 60, even though AJ Johnson has gotten a little more opportunity over the second half of the season, he still hasn't made much of an impact most of his time in the NBL, but he is a prime candidate to rise in the pre-draft process. It's kind of hard to gauge his growth over the last year, but he's 6'7 with some high level scoring flashes, he's a good athlete, and he's super young. It's definitely more of a placeholder ranking for now, but he's on the board. I still have more faith in Kobe Johnson than it seems most others do. Whether or not that's a good thing is very much up for debate given he's shooting 37% from the floor and sub 30% from the three this year, but I just buy his defense and playmaking with a good physical profile on the wing and think he could be a rotation piece if you can get the shot together, which isn't necessarily broken, so that's why he continues to be on the board for me. Kentucky's Uganda Onyenso has been one of the best rim protectors and has had a game of 8 and 10 blocks in his last 5 contests which is pretty ridiculous and a 7 footer with a 7 5 wingspan who can do that and finish plays at the rim is a pretty easy sell even with some of his touch and skill set questions that show up from time to time. While he hasn't shot it anywhere like we wanted to see, Reese Beekman has come back a better player this year and nearly willed Virginia to some wins as of late. He continues to be a high level point of attack defender with a steal rate around 5 and a block rate around 2, but he's been more aggressive and effective as a driver, he's made good reads, and he's just someone I wouldn't count out even as we wait on the shot. I am a bit worried about Trevor Brazil from an injury perspective. He's coming off the ACL last year and has missed a lot of time with knee soreness this year and just hasn't looked right when he's been out there. So I still think there's appeal for a floor spacing four man who can finish plays and protect the rim help side, but he's got to be healthy to rise where he was previously for me. There's an endless search for shooters with good size in the league, and Iowa's Peyton Sanford is fitting the bill. He's been really impressive in that aspect this year, one of the best at playing off of movement, both from three and in cutting and getting to pin downs in the mid-range, and at a list of 6'7", it'll always keep you with at least some NBA interest. And what's been an otherwise disappointing year for Kentucky's Justin Edwards, he's at least shown some signs of life recently. I still don't know what the pitch is for him other than pointing to his priors and physical tools, but if he can continue being a net positive down the stretch, he'll certainly win somebody over in the second round given some of those priors. Syracuse's Judah Mintz has recently coming off a big time performance against UNC and his synopsis as a prospect remains the same. He's a rim seeking guard, he's crafty, he makes plays in the pick and roll and is active on defense, but as long as he's a mostly non-shooter both off the bounce and off the catch, it's going to be tough to be super high on him as a player in my opinion. Pakum Dadie continues to have some really intriguing moments as this athletic 3 and D wing, most recently against Zachary Rizache again going for 15 points and showing off a lot of his upside and what he does as a player. Now we'll see what he ends up doing this year and if he does declare, but he's definitely somebody I would draft if that does end up being his choice. 
San Francisco's Jonathan Mogbo has emerged as a serious draftable player. He was a bit of a late bloomer who was a guard in high school and grew late. He had to go to the Juco route. He went to Missouri State last year and has just taken off this season as a 6'8 big who literally matches up and defends every position. He finishes plays as well as anyone and has some eye-catching flashes as a ball handler and passer. Now he does project as a non-shooting floor right now which isn't the most friendly NBA archetype in this era but he's too productive and impressive as a mover with one of the highest BPMs in college basketball to not be somewhere on my board. Uga Poplar has been dealing with a lot of injuries this season and I think that's part of the reason he's trended in the wrong direction in conference play, but I still think he's an intriguing talent as an athletic 3 and D off guard who has improved off the dribble, but some of his individual struggles coinciding with Miami's struggles as a team haven't made him any easier to bet on. Harrison Ingram has regained his status as a draftable prospect in his junior season transferring from Stanford. He's been this high field playmaker forward who's kind of a jack of all trades and is a heady defender but the strides that he's made as a shooter has been the thing that's gotten him back on the board. Still got some athletic limitations and you question how real the shot is especially with the free throw numbers but he's proven he belongs. Florida State's Jameer Watkins continues to be one of the most underrated prospects to me and someone I think will rise during the draft process. He's one of the best wing defenders in the class, he's got NBA level tools and offensively he's taken on a bigger role in a jump to the ACC and looks solid. Now the shot will be key for him but he checks a lot of boxes and will be someone to keep an eye on. Colorado's KJ Simpson has been one of the best guards in college basketball and I think he's earned his way into being a lock as a draftable prospect. He's an all-around guard who can play on and off the ball and is knocking on the door of a 50-40-90 season. It's always tougher for smaller guards but I think KJ's all-around game and improvements in a lot of those areas we've been talking about is worth a second round pick at the very least. Tyrese Proctor has been one of the more frustrating players I've scouted in the last couple years because he'll have games like Louisville or Clemson where he's exactly the well-rounded creative guard with good size that you're looking for and then he'll have others where he plays entirely too passive, is a poor decision maker and just looks like he'll be in school for a whole nother year. Now I still think he's probably better than he's performed this year but he's going to need to show it down the stretch to have any real confidence confidence in him, at least in this draft. Clemson's PJ Hall remains a really solid prospect as a do-it-all big man who can space the floor, make a play, and has made improvements defensively. He's tough, he's skilled in close, and though I think there's reasonable hesitation in him being a bit of a modern tweener at the 4 or 5, depending on the roster context, he's just another good player who impressed at last year's combine and will likely do it again and boost his stock from there. A Dim Bona is someone I could very easily see outperforming a draft slot just given the type of athletic talent he has and the way he's able to cover ground defensively, but he can still be a bit sporadic and get into foul trouble and turn the ball over way more than you'd like, although a lot of the times the usage is way too high for him than it should be. But all things considered, he's proven himself as a viable early second round option for a team in search of an energy bid. Alex Caravan has dealt with a few injuries here and there, but it hasn't kept him from being a consistent positive presence for one of the best teams in the country for a second year straight, and he's only boosted his stock lately. He's a knockdown shooter with size who makes winning plays and has gotten better at converting twos and closeouts. I still wonder about him matchup wise defensively in the NBA, but he's a good player and might still be underrated by myself and others. Baylor Shireman has been on the fringes of the board for a few years now, even dating back to when he was at South Dakota State, but I think this is the year that he finally hears his name called. He's a big time lefty shooter at 6A who can put it on the floor and makes plays for others in a variety of ways, and even with the athletic or defensive concerns that might be there, he just makes things happen and is putting up triple doubles in the Big East, so I think someone will be interested in taking him and maybe even a little higher than he's represented on Mox right now. Adama Ball has made a big impression in his first year at Santa Clara, especially as a scorer on the wing and showing flashes defensively. Now, I know some have skepticism in him outside of the self-creation, but I like what he does. I think there's enough pieces there and he's relatively young as he doesn't turn 21 until December. DJ Wagner has been dealing with a high ankle sprain and has caused him to miss some time and you can also still see it when he's been back out there. 
I think he's a solid bet as a dynamic combo guard who has shown a lot as a driver and defender and in his growth as a passer, but the pull up in the shot still being where it is will make it tough for him to get back into serious first round combos before the combine. And if he can't get fully healthy, I'm not 100% sure where he'll land on draft night. Now this is the time of the year where you start to see some freshmen you might have listed as a two-year guy emerge and rise late. And one of those for me is Minnesota's Cam Christie given his recent stretch. He's a super talented shooter and scorer at 6'6". And no, I would say this is probably a little premature given his physical stature and the questions in him at the rim. He's got obvious first round upside, whether it happens this year or next. So he lands on the board for now and will look to make an impact at the next level like his older brother, Max Christie. I gave most of my big picture thoughts on Zach Eady last board, so I won't do that to y'all again. He's made important improvements to his body and the production is there. I just don't know if we see this seamless first round level transition from over 60% of his possessions being post ups to being a modern NBA big. Now, now, I do still think he's got a good chance of being a productive backup and even start games in the right context as an interior force and drop big at 7 4, but anything past that, for a lot of those reasons we mentioned last time, is just a harder sell for me. Tyler Kolak has had weeks where he's the clear best point guard in the country and then also had games where he's a bit overwhelmed by some superior athletes, but for the most part his vast improvement as a shooter matched with his vision, pick and roll play, and competitiveness scream rotational guard even with some of his defensive and athletic limitations. Hunter Salas has been one of the best breakout stories of the year in transferring from Gonzaga and finally getting to shine at Wake Forest. He's been automatic from three, big time scorer from all over the floor and a competitive defender. Now I always get the hesitancy in drafting players that take multiple years to make an impact because that track record isn't great and also given he's kind of in that gray area between combo guard and wing but I think Salas has a chance to buck that trend and right now has at least put himself in the conversation for player of the year in the ACC. Dylan Jones is one of the more interesting players that I think I've scouted over the last couple years. He's still putting up some unreal numbers at 20 points, 10 rebounds, 5 assists, and 2 steals, and just has an intriguing skill set as an oversized guard, but I'm still unsure of how he fits in the NBA. He is high field, gets it done, and he's another guy who showed out at the combines last year, so I'd probably take a chance on him anywhere from like 25 on down, but I'm curious to see how that adjustment goes for him. Santa Barbara's AJ Mitchell continues to be one of the most impressive mid-major and playmaking prospects in the country. I still want him to shoot the three ball more in the future, but he's at least been good off the catch there and I like his ability to make things happen with his craft and feel. And it's hard not to look back at a guy like a Brandon Projemski as a high-end reference to someone in his sort of lane having success. Also, Iguodaro is one of those players you only have to watch a couple times to see the type of impact he can have on the game. He's mobile and scheme versatile defensively. He's a good short roll playmaker and dribble handoff partner. He can finish plays at the rim and with the push shot. There's just a lot I see him fitting into at the next level. And right now he's a big reason of why I think Marquette can still make an elite eight run, though everybody kind of jumped off the bandwagon after seeing them get smacked by UConn. Over his last eight games, Trey Alexander is averaging 21 points, 7 rebounds, and 5 assists on 50-36-90 splits, and I think he should regain some of his stock, especially if he can stay hot as a shooter. He's rounded his game out, and I think he could improve a rotation, and for that he stays in the late first, early second round range. Arizona's Pella Larson has all the tools to be a complimentary piece in the NBA. He's tough defensively, he's high field, he makes plays in numerous ways, and though he's another guy I still want to see be more aggressive and look for his three ball more consistently, he just checks a lot of boxes and shouldn't go much later than the 30s on draft night. We're getting to the point where the production and skill level outweigh any concerns in Jalen Tyson's game, and I think he'll only gain more traction as the year goes on, even being on a Cal team that's middle of the road at best. He's a 6'7 wing who does a little of everything and operates as their point forward a lot of times. He'll of course need to adjust to a role that asks less of him in terms of usage, but he makes it happen in a lot of ways. In the recent games against SC and Washington, 
or good looks at him if you haven't watched him yet. Melvin Agenta has continued to produce at the Pro-A level as a 6'7 athletic wing who has excelled as a shot maker. I do think you at least turn your head when you look over the course of a season and see someone's assists are that low and the stocks numbers are pretty much non-existent even though I think he has been solid on defense but nonetheless I think someone will find him useful anywhere from 20 to 40 given his tools and shot making that he's shown at his age. I liked seeing Ethan Elmansa make an early impact in his limited Rising Stars time and he's been doing the same for Ignite all year and just making things happen. He's done a lot as a play finisher and pick and roll big man and though I've become just a little more hesitant in putting him as high as I have in the past just based off of his size and I still like him and think he might be underrated given his track record. I think Deron Holmes has done enough to at least get into that early second round range this year. He's expanded his game not only as a three point shooter, though that's the most important part, he's a much more capable closeout attacker and decision maker on dribble handoffs and side to side stuff and on top of that he's still a presence as an athlete finishing plays, protecting the rim and being versatile on defense. Now my biggest concern still comes with his size and strength. He didn't measure out the greatest at the combine last year, but to me he's shown that he belongs here. Tristan Da Silva. Tristan Da Silva is one of the most solid prospects in this class and continues to make an impact in nearly every game. Now there are times I do get concerned in his athleticism, some of the foot speed on defense and his play style can feel a little antiquated, but his combo of feel on both ends, steady shooting and playmaking at 6'8 is more than enough to overcome that. And if he lands on a team like a Denver or a Milwaukee or Cleveland, I think he could hit the ground running. Kilo Ware probably picked the wrong situation twice for two different reasons, but he's still shown the type of talent that makes him worthy of a first round pick. He's athletic, he moves well, he can protect the brim, he has upside to space the floor and will likely shine more on offense eventually with more competent playmakers. Now he's still a bit frustrating at times and the motor and physicality isn't completely where you want it though it's been better, but I'd be fairly happy if he's available in the late teens and 20s and it looks like that's where he's going to end up. I think the general pitch for Bobby Clintman remains the same as a guy who can play that complimentary wing role as a shooter, team playmaker, and has the upside to defend a couple positions at a solid level, though we're going to need some more consistency out of him there. He was up and down this year and saw his minutes fluctuate, but I like the growth that he's shown in the past two years, even dating back to his senior year at Sunrise, and think he's a viable late first, early second round option. Jared McCain just recently put together one of the best games from a freshman in college basketball this season, going for 35 against Florida State, and it was really just more of what he's done all year. He's got all the pieces of a solid secondary guard in the league who can knock down threes, make smart plays, defends, and has finished at the bucket above expectation. Now, he's not the best athlete and doesn't have the type of measurables that scream NBA player, which does mean something, especially at the guard spot, but he gets it done. He's been invaluable for this Duke team, and I think he has first round upside whether he declares this year or next. Providence's Devin Carter has continued to rise over the year, and when you watch games like the overtime win against Creighton or the big night against DePaul, it's pretty easy to see why. He's a big time competitor and point of attack defender who has also made major strides as a three point shooter and in his confidence as an overall offensive player. Now, he's not the type of guard that you're drafting to run your offense, but he's also a decent playmaker that should excel with the league's star playmakers next to him, and he just has a great shot at contributing for years to come. Tyler Smith has continued to be a consistent force as a stretch big for this Ignite team, having some of his best performances in the last month, and he's someone that should be in the conversations for best shooter in his class. I do still think that there's some defensive questions there that we'll get to in more detail in a video, but right now, I wouldn't be surprised if he sneaks into one of those last spots in the lottery with the way that he's been playing. Now I know some people are still split on Ryan Dunn and I get it given his serious offensive questions, but there are very few players in this class I'm more confident in having an NBA level trait than Dunn on the defensive end because he's got all defense level upside there to me. Now is there a world where he could still be a bad shooter and just cut, screen, finish plays in the right context? Maybe, but the shot is vital and if you're picking him, you're likely pouring a lot of immediate resources into making that a reality and hopefully seeing what I think could be lottery level returns if everything pans out. Now the case for Kevin McCullough as a prospect is a pretty easy one to make. The offensive expansion has been good to see and specifically in the jump in confidence and percentage as a three point shooter, but 
in the league he'll be in roles that are much closer to what we saw in the past and to me that was already a draftable guy so he's pretty firmly in his range and from a college perspective i'm curious to see how far he can take this top heavy ku squad as he works himself back into full health Keyshawn George has been another one of those players I've had penciled in as a breakout sophomore, partially because of some of the physicality, but over the last month or so, he's kind of sped that timeline up. He's a big guard or wing at 6'8", who was really impressed as a playmaker and ball handler. He's shooting the lights out, and most importantly, he's made improvements defensively over the year. He's dealt with some ankle injuries as well, and that Boston College game is one of those you wish you could forget, but I think he's demonstrated the tools to be a first-round pick in this class and could continue to rise over the next few months given his talent at that size. Donovan Klingon is a huge part of this UConn team being in position to make another Final Four run. His length and ability to protect the rim are a huge part of this defense and his appeal as a prospect and offensively the play finishing, screening, and the passing upside lend itself to the league as well. I still worry a little about the injuries and conditioning long term, but he stays fairly high on the board and could climb for myself and many teams if he could replicate his March run from last year but in more minutes and volume. And doing what he did to Marquette could be a pretty good start. Baylor's Eve Misi has proven himself as one of the best bigs in this class as an athletic play finisher and rim protector with a clear NBA role. He's also had flashes of putting the ball on the floor. He's also had flashes of putting the ball on the floor, a few passes that I've liked, and he's improved as a free throw shooter as of late. And putting that on top of all the other things he does, I think he's got a chance of being a lottery pick. Tijon Salon is still one of the biggest wild cards in this class. His upside is fairly easy to buy this year as a 6'9 athletic wing who continues to grow as a shooter and is making an impact as an 18 year old in Pro A. He's still very raw as a playmaker and in his defensive field, but I think a team that will be patient with him could end up with some real value, especially because he is the same age as some 2025 prospects. Tennessee's Dalton Connect went on one of the most impressive scoring runs we've seen in the last few years after he fully recovered from the ankle injury. He had a six game stretch where he went for 32 a game and shot 45% from three on seven attempts. And even though I'd say he's slowed down since then, He's still getting you 20 nightly in various ways and showing why he belongs here as a prospect. Now he is an older guy and I still have a lot of thoughts on his defense that aren't necessarily positive, but I think he's a clear top 20 guy right now and he might just be the SEC player of the year in his first year in the conference. Since Johnny Furphy has been inserted in the starting lineup, he's been able to show the first round upside that he has and I think he could be a potential lottery pick. He's a 6'8 wing with good size, who's a solid athlete, a good spot up shooter and is unselfish and moves really well without the ball both in the half court and in transition. Now he's not much of a creator and I've been middle of the road on his defense but I've been a big fan of his as of late and I know teams around the league are trending in that direction. Baylor's Jacoby Walter has hit a huge wall over the last month and a half, shooting about 30% from the field and around 25% from three, which is not what you want to see from anyone, but especially a prospect whose presumed primary elite skill is the shot. You match that with some still shaky defense and a creation game that leaves more to be desired, albeit improved, and you have a prospect that I have a lot less confidence in than in the past. Now we'll see if it ends up being more of a dry spell for a talented young guy, but he's not trending in the direction you'd want and some of those concerns pop even more when that happens. Kyle Filipowski has had some subpar games lately, but in the grand scheme, he's given more confidence in him as a prospect with his improvements defensively. I've mentioned this since last year, but if he is more of a reputation shooter that's streaky at 34% and sub 70% at the line, it's going to be tougher for him to provide the top 10 consensus value that's there, but I like his skill level as a big. We've talked about all the things that he's capable of, and I do think he should benefit from the NBA game. My past ranking was just a little too high for my current life but he's still obviously in that same general range. And Reece Shepard has shown more of his capabilities as a driver and pull-up scorer in recent weeks and that's the type of stuff that you want to see from him. Not that he's fully convinced me that he's going to be a lead guard in the league, but he's given more confidence that he can create in some capacity. Now, I haven't loved the amount of times that he's been attacked on defense and just his off-ball discipline on that end, but other than that, he's just been an obvious winner this entire year and someone I'll be comfortable betting on, even if there are certain things that haven't popped yet at Kentucky. 
Now it has been good to see Stefan Castle reemerge as a top prospect after an underwhelming start. The complete passivity as a shooter and self creator has improved even though it still needs some work and in addition to that he's been one of the most impressive wing slash guard defenders around and a solid connective passer. I think Castle is only scratching the surface and if you can mold him into a more modern shot diet and raise his confidence he's someone I think can make an impact in some way it just might not be the exact guy we thought could go top five when we got into this year. Isaiah Collier returned surprisingly quick since suffering that wrist injury and he's been really good despite this USC team still continuing to struggle to get W's. But now that Collier is back he's at least got a chance to show growth as a shooter, decision maker and in his defensive effort and given the recent trend and play that he's shown it seems that he's on the way to doing that. And I think with the type of physical playmaking talent that he is at the lead guard spot, top 10 is still very much in play if the right situation is there. Modest Buzelis was one of the biggest winners of the Rising Stars event, hitting the game winning shot over Brandon Miller to knock off Team Pow and pull off the upset. Now that doesn't really mean anything for his overall outlook, but it was a good moment to see and he's still a tough player to quit on as a big wing who can be a complimentary playmaker and has improved at handling physicality and on the defensive end throughout the year. Now the shot is going to be key and will decide a lot for him, but I'm optimistic and still think that he can be one of the most impactful guys in his class. Another top tier Kentucky guy off their bench, Rob Dillingham continues to be one of the most electric players in college basketball and what he did to one of the best defenses in the country in Tennessee going for 35 a few weeks ago was special and he continues to make it happen in whatever way is necessary. Now I still have some questions in his size and defense and as a finisher in close but unless his play really tails off he'll have a good chance of being a lottery pick in June and has made some pretty unbelievable progress as a winning player over the last year. Cody Williams has been one of the most talked about prospects in college basketball over the last couple months and for good reason. He's a lanky wing with impressive slashing and secondary ball handling abilities and is lit it up from three though on limited attempts. I still have questions about him physically where he fits in on defense and then in his expansion as a scorer. I feel like some of the conversations around him don't account for any of that especially when we start talking number one, number two, number three pick but I do like him as a top five-ish prospect and I think Think he'll likely land there in June. Draft Express recently reported Nikola Topic is still a week or so away from being back to full activity so we'll await his return there and I still wouldn't rule out him making a run in the top three if he can produce in the Euro League and hit on a few of those areas we talked about throughout the year. He's a big guard who's shown himself to be possibly the best playmaker and driver in the class and though the shot and defense are big question marks, I think he's got one of the highest ceilings in the class and remains here for that reason. Zachary Rizache continues to be one of the premier options in this draft as a 6'8", 6'9", wing who shoots it at a high level and has the attributes of the connective wings that are invaluable around the league. My main concerns still come from his ability to create and make decisions on the fly though he has shown a few more flashes there and then he is still pretty thin for me to love as like the top dog but he fits in every situation that's going to be up there in the top of the lottery. He's been consistent and bounced back from some of his low moments and for all that he's pretty much locked into this range for me. Ron Holland recently announced that he's out for the year with a thumb injury which you never like to see but I think that he's done enough to stick as a top 5 prospect in this class. We all have our reservations about the Ignite as a program but he produced as well as almost anyone. He's got great tools on both ends of the floor, he brings energy and has transformed his skill set in just a year's time. He'll be one of the first scouting reports I do this season so be on the lookout for that and we'll hopefully detail all the pieces in his game and the possible outcomes even better than we did in the first look video. In at number one, once again, we have French big man Alex Sar. He's had some notable games since returning from injury, going for 18 and 5 blocks, 14 and 12 rebounds, 17, 4, 2 and 2, all in about 20 minutes a night, and he's shown most of what he does best in all of those games. I don't think he's the type of prospect where if the fit isn't right, you just take him over some of the other options that might be there, but I am most confident in his ability to affect the game defensively, and I think he's got a few avenues to NBA success. He is still a bit raw on offense, the shot isn't something you'd be super confident in, and he'll need to develop physically, and I also wish we saw him in a situation that wasn't so stingy with his minutes and usage, because 
that has made things trickier than they should be, but he's produced in what he's been given and continues to be in the top tier of my board. I appreciate y'all for watching this video. We are getting closer to that time of year where we start dropping the scouting reports really frequently on the channel. So definitely stay locked for all that coming up soon. I'm gonna try my best to get out as many of those as possible. Definitely more than we have in the last few years. So that's the ultimate goal. But yeah, that's really all I had to say uh, in this one. Be sure to leave a like if you enjoyed, subscribe if you are new to the channel and leave a comment down below if some guys you think could continue to rise in this class as we keep going in the process and also some of your personal favorites. But yeah, as always, I'm Keandre. This is Hoopin' Elect. Until next time, I'm out.